the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It's 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day, Monday, March 14th. Here are the top stories we are following for you at this hour. The talks begin. Top officials from the United States and China have started the first high-level in-person discussions since the war began in Ukraine. The conversation comes as the Biden administration seeks Beijing's help with Russian President Vladimir Putin. And another lockdown. China imposes restrictions on its tech hub of Shenzhen, potentially inflicting the biggest coronavirus-related blow to growth since a nationwide lockdown in 2020 as the the rest of the world braces for further supply shocks. What does that mean for the markets? Well, climbing yields, bonds sell off, sending yields to the highest since July 2019 as the in insulation, excuse me, isolation of Russia upends commodity flows and investors anticipate the start of a rate hike cycle. From New York, I'm Kriti Gupta with Guy Johnson in London. Alex Steele is off. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Guys, so much to digest here, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, commodity flows, and of course, the spotlight back on the Fed this week. Absolutely. And everything feels inflationary, doesn't it? That story out of China feels inflationary. What is happening with the commodity story, I appreciate that we're seeing lower oil prices today, but generally that story feels inflationary too. The question that I'm trying to answer here, and it kind of goes to our question of the day, what is the bond market really pricing right now is, are we in a position where the Fed is going to be aggressive, but not that aggressive because it's worried about causing an inflation, or is it going to have to cause an inflation because uh, it's worried about a recession, or is it going to have to cause a recession in order basically to deal with inflation? I think that's what everybody's trying to get their arms around right now, and I'm getting really conflicting signals from various market participants. So let's try and get an answer to that question. Romain Bostic, co-host of Bloomberg Markets, The Close. Ira Jersey, chief U.S. rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence, joining us now. Ira, what are we pricing in now? Yeah, so we're pricing in for basically eight full rate hikes over the next uh, year and a half or so. And, and uh, you know, that means that the Federal Reserve is, you know, the, the market thinks that the Fed's going to go pretty quick here. And in fact, we're still priced for uh, basically a hike at every meeting this year and maybe, you know, a chance of a 50 basis point here at some point. Uh, I, I don't think that they'll be able to go quite that fast because of some of the risks that you mentioned to the, the growth outlook. But for sure, the market thinks that the Fed's going to hike and hike pretty aggressively. Romain, let's bring you into the conversation here because we have to talk about the geopolitical tensions at yeah. play. It wasn't too long ago where we saw the Fed, the hawkish Fed, kind of yeah. take a back seat for yields. And now yeah. that's kind of driving the narrative. What do you make of it? Well, it took a back seat briefly here. We talk about where we were sort of in mid-February, where you saw yields basically peak out at, at least on the 10-year, above that 207 level. They dropped immediately after that because of the war in Ukraine, because everyone thought the geopolitics would sort of overwhelm inflation. Well, the problem now is that geopolitics are inflation. And of course, the war in, in Ukraine has proven that inflation is not only a problem, but probably a bigger problem than what it was before the war. And that's a big part of the reason why you're looking at yields right now, making these moves higher. It's a big part of the reason, uh, Kriti, why you're looking at uh, break-evens. The expectations 10 years out above 3%. The expectations five years out right now at 3.6%. Remain. What are stocks pricing? What are we? What is the stock market telling us? Is the stock market just a derivative of the bond market right now, or is the stock market got any useful kind of signalling here? Stocks yeah. have remained relatively elevated through this. We've come down quite a long way, but you look at mm -hmm. where we are in historical terms, we haven't come down that far. So just give me a sense of what you think the signal we're getting from stocks is. Yeah. Are we going to get a recession? Are we not going to get a recession? Are earnings going to hold up? Are earnings not going to hold up? I think the general consensus based on the pricing is that earnings aren't going to hold up. It's now a question, Guy, of how severe it's going to be. You think back a couple of months ago here, there was a pretty strong negative correlation between the rise in yields and the drop that we saw in stock prices. That correlation is still there, though, not necessarily as strong as it was a couple of months ago. So I think when you see what happens on Wednesday with the Fed announcing, I mean, it's really going to be about two things, uh, what, not just whether we get a rate hike, but whether they decide to be a little bit more aggressive, go with 50 basis points. That's being priced out right now. But whether they communicate that going forward that, yes, there is a real scenario that we could see six, seven, eight hikes this year. And, of course, maybe a faster drawdown of that balance sheet. 
Ira, hop back in here into the conversation. I'm curious what this means when we're looking at things in terms of the commodity shock, because it kind of seemed like for a second the geopolitical situation, like Romaine said, was outweighing the hawkish Fed. Do we expect comments from Chairman Powell on simply what that commodity shock might look like and how long it might last? Well, I don't think we'll, it, he'll necessarily say how long it'll last, right? He'll he'll say that it's it's unclear that whenever you have these types of risks, that will continue to uh, they'll continue to monitor the situation. But but I think the, the answer to the question that that he is likely to get asked, like you just mentioned, is, you know that that. The Federal Reserve can only do so much. The Federal Reserve really controls the demand side of the balance sheet. So to Guy's point earlier when we were talking about what the Fed's going to do, the Fed basically can only drive us into a recession in order to get inflation lower because it can only uh, stop demand. I was just looking this morning at the the number of gallons of gasoline sold because of how high uh, gasoline prices are at the pump. And those have come off very dramatically. In fact, they're right at the lowest level that they've been about the last five years. So. So these higher prices are already crimping demand, and that's creating a tax on the consumer, uh, which is going to slow real GDP and real economic growth going forward. But until that starts to hit the job market, the Fed is going to be feel it's okay to hike. Now, once the job market turns around, if you start to see job losses at some point and a slowing of wage growth, that's when the Fed has to be really cautious. And that's why I think like the Fed ultimately is going to go a lot slower than what the market. Markets, uh, what the market's pricing for right now. Um, now, what, what that means, of course, is that maybe two-year yields are getting to a point where they're not going to be able to go up as quickly as they had been. Uh, but I still think you're going to see a 2% uh, a two percent two-year yield at some point this year. Romaine, I'm curious about the point that Ira just made here, the fact that the Fed can't tackle those commodity prices. They're not tackling the supply issues. They're tackling the yeah. demand, mm -hmm. right? But I'm wondering if, if you kind of put the demand destruction that you're seeing from commodity flows on top of the Fed trying to kind of control demand, right. at what point does that become a double whammy? And at what point does that become even bigger odds for a recession? Well, I think this is what the Fed has to address. And this is the conversation that's going to be had on Tuesday and Wednesday, is how do you sort of ease demand? You don't want to obviously destroy it. Right. Uh, in the sense uh, of what the Fed is trying to do. But how do you ease that in the face of, I guess, market forces that are already seem to be doing that uh, right now? And to Ira's point, too, when we talk about so kind of the feed through into the stock market here, you keep an eye on some of those discretionary names. And I think that's where you're going to start to see most of the pain. We've seen it there already. Remember, this isn't just about what you're paying at the gas pump. It's what you're paying at the grocery store. It's what you're paying to go out to eat. It's what you're paying uh, when you go to the store to buy, you know, new pants for your kids. Uh, these are really already being felt. You see it anecdotally, and it's eventually going to show up in the data. Ira, we're going to get a dot plot. We're going to get a, 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 an economic outlook from the Fed this week. How big an upgrade do you think we're going to see in terms of the rate picture from that dot plot? What is the Fed going to be signaling? And to come back to this point about the demand side of the economy, how high do rates have to go, do you think, before we start to see a meaningful impact on the economy? Where do you think that point is? Do we need to get into positive real rates? How high do nominal rates have to go before they start uh, affecting the U.S. consumer, U.S. US industry? Well, I, I have to say a couple of things about that. You know, th there's a lot of pieces to that question. But I think that the big thing is we have to remember inflation on a year on year basis is going to be lower in nine months than it has been the last couple of months. Right. So just base effects alone are going to drive some of that. And certainly if oil prices even just stabilize right where they are now, you're going to have inflation that's going to be closer to four percent. Do we need to get real rates to the positive in order to feel the economic impacts of that? The answer is no. I think that we're already starting to see the economic impact of that. Certainly, if you get mortgage rates that go up another 25 to 50 basis points, you're really likely to see the housing market slow pretty substantially. I know there's some, some supply issues. There's not a lot of supply of houses on the market. But at the same time, if, uh, if uh, you can wind up getting mortgage rates that get close to 5%, it's hard to see that not crimping demand um, for, for the housing market. So there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. So the, the, the Fed, I think, is going to, what you're going to see in both the summary of economic projections and the dot plot is a wider dispersion of uh, outcomes that members of the Fed think are going to happen. So you have people like like President Wallard and, and, and Bullard say, uh, uh, they say you're going to get significantly higher maybe interest rates in the out term, maybe even three, three and a half percent in some cases. But then others that still think that the terminal rate is going to be somewhere in the low two percent area. So I think that dispersion is going to be what what is going to be the story for the summary of economic projections and the dot plot this month.
Well, lots to digest. Bloomberg's Romaine Bostic and Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence, we thank you both so much for your time. Coming up, we'll get an investor's take on our question of the day. What is the bond market really pricing? G-squared private wealth CIO Victoria Green joins next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get back to our question of the day. What is the bond market really pricing in? Joining us now is Victoria Green, G Squared Private Wealth CIO. It's an in independent boutique investment advisory firm focused on ultra high net worth individuals with over half a billion dollars in AUM. Victoria, thank you so much for joining us. Let's put that question to you. What exactly is the bond market pricing in? There's certainly a lot to digest. Yeah, right now with the curve flattening uh, as extremely as it has, I think it's pricing in that, look, I think a recession's coming and, and you guys should be playing defense a little bit more than playing offense. You know, I'll freely admit we came into this year as a, as a buyer of dips, uh, but you can't be agnostic to this fundamental shift that's happened with the Russian war in Ukraine and the likelihood that sanctions are going to stick and inflation is going to be longer. We all thought inflation would peak here, Q1, Q2, and now that keeps pushing out inflation even further back. I mean, your 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 break even now on the 10 year are above 3% for the first time ever since 98. How do you position for a recession? Should you position for a recession? Should you position for a recession once it's arrived? I'm wondering what history tells us, Victoria, uh, about what stock investors in particular should be doing as they think about the possibility of an, uh, a recession coming. What is, what is the right place to be? How do you sequence that story out? Sure. So first off, there's a lot of variables on the table here. So our, our signal flashing that a recession is probably going to come Yes, but you haven't seen a lot of signals flip left yet. PMI is still above 50, unemployment rates at 3.8. That's very low, but hasn't bottomed out yet. The curve is very close to inverting. I think the 510 spreads now like five basis points, but hasn't inverted yet. So you have all these signals on the precipice that, that could reverse. But right now we are thinking that this drag from the war, the inflationary drag that's going to come from economy is going to put pressure. So what do you do? I think you want to shore up your portfolios. I think you want to be in areas that are a little lower beta, a little higher quality. You want companies that have cash flow, that have strong balance sheets, you know, ability to weather a little bit of a tighter market and not be so yep. stretched and, and probably not trading at that value. Victoria, you got any names for me? You got any names <laughs> for me? Yeah, we like the, the energy space still. I mean, I know they've been on a great run, but we think energy might... Prices will remain high. You know, we like on the big side, the Chevrons are a good place to be. We, we like the EMPs, your, your Devon Energy. Honestly, a name that not a lot of people talk about is we like IBM. That's a great value tech stock. It doesn't mean you have to shun tech from your portfolio, but you want to be buying things that have, like I said, stability, quality, not trading on an extreme multiple, and generally looking around. You know, financials have come off a lot. Uh, I think you want to own the right financials right now. Uh, we're bunkered a lot more in the U.S. So we're looking at, at names that have a little less international exposure, a little more U.S. domestic uh, exposure for their revenues. Victoria, we're seeing a little bit of green on the screen when we're talking about the equity market here. Is the bottom in from simply the sell-off that we've seen that really hasn't let up since the start of the year? What do you think? I mean, I'm just happy to see green, but I'm going to say let's see if the green holds through close. That's always been killer for us, right, holding on to our gains through end of close. I don't think the bottom's coming in until we have a, a clear resolution of what's happening in Ukraine. And even our best case scenario that we get to a negotiating table and the conflict stops, looks like we're probably going to keep sanctions on, on Russia, which is just going to make the inflation story even more difficult. I don't think the bottom's in yet. Um, I think if you have a strong stomach, you know, and, and we have any more extreme dips, uh, you might look to add to it. But yeah. I don't think this is over yet. Victoria, when we get a recession, if we get a recession... What does the Fed do at recession? that point? Because, yeah, let's say we get one. What does the Fed do? Does the Fed want to lean in and make that recession easier, i.e. reduce rates, maybe do other things in terms of the policy, that it, the policy tools that it has? Or is it going to look at that recession and say, this is what is required. We need to deal with the demand side in order to deal with the inflation, as a result of which you're not going to get a quick response from the Fed when that recession comes. Yeah, I think the Fed wants a time machine. I think the Fed wants to go back and start hiking last year. I think the Fed's in a horrible spot. They've got to go. Inflation's rampant. Inflation's going to stick. I'm still on the sticks heights. 
Uh, I don't think the the, the Fed is, is going to be dovish. Uh, I think they're going to run off their balance sheet. I think they feel like they have to. I think they know they're playing from behind at this point. Uh, so I think the people expecting the Fed to kind of run in and that, oh, if, if we start slowing down, will the Fed slow down? I feel like the Fed feels like they almost have to move enough to give them that cushion that they can come back down on rates when we hit a, a, an actual recession. Uh, and remember, GDP is like two thirds of the consumer. And so if this consumer is getting squeezed at the pump, the consumer is certainly gonna have less to spend elsewhere and, and they're getting squeezed at the pump, the grocery store, as your other guest had mentioned. So Fed, I don't think has any choice but to be hawkish and it's, it's an unenviable position to be in. So Victoria, we've talked about the Fed, we've talked about Russia and Ukraine. The other major story this morning has simply been China's zero COVID policy, the fact that they've shut down their major technology hub. How much of there is a read through into the United States, into the West from what's going on in China? It's going to bleed. I mean, as they shut down chip factories, I think Foxconn shut down and you're seeing that drag a little bit on Apple. And, and they certainly do supply a lot of things for us. So we have to be cautious of what a shutdown will do. I don't think I think the zero COVID policy is, is, a, is a smaller minority of the world. I think the rest of us have kind of decided to live with it as our policy. So I don't see lockdowns continuing to spread anywhere, but I do see that just making the supply chain even worse. You know, you, you just seem to have this confluence of factors and, and, you know, between Russia getting frozen out of the market and now China's kind of self-freezing them out of the market and then concerns if China will get sanctioned if it sides with Russia, you're talking about just making it yeah. harder to get parts. Victoria, is all of this manageable or is there a danger that some of this becomes systemic? I, some of the problems we're experiencing right now, it could be a Russian default, it could be uh, China having problems uh, it, it, with, with its property sector. There's a whole range of potential things that could be systemic here. Do you think we could be heading towards a systemic event and again, is, is that something that's just a tail risk right now or is that creeping in from the tails? Look, I'm never a big fan of like the sky is falling and everything's gonna be terrible. I think the higher probability is these do work out without the, the end of the world per se, economically. Uh, you know, there's different types of recessions, either the duration or the, the severity of it. Uh, I don't think this is an 08 type global meltdown, but you do need to see some cooler heads prevail. Uh, we'd like to see some progress. I think all of these problems could be fixable. So uh, I, I don't think it's good for the world at all. I, I do, I mean, it, it's sad for me. I don't like being bearish. It, it's just, it feels wrong to bet against the, the world. And that's what it feels like when you say, hey, look, there's risk in the market. But I think investors can bunker in. I don't think all stocks are created equal. We've seen that, the growth value divide here. I don't think this means you just need to sit in cash because there's a risk yep. to cash in an inflationary environment. Absolutely. Inflation. Victoria, great stuff. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Victoria Green of G Squared Private Wealth, thank you very much indeed. What have we got coming up for you? The US is seeking China's help to end the war with Ukraine. Uh, we're going to have the latest on the high-level talks. They're happening in Rome right now. We're expecting a briefing shortly. This is Bloomberg. So the US and China holding their first high-level in-person talks since Russia invaded Ukraine. The Biden administration wants China to exert its influence over Moscow to end this war. Jake Sullivan might be briefing shortly. We should get a readout fairly soon. What should we expect from this conversation, though? Let's go to Washington, D.C. to find out. Bloomberg's Washington correspondent, Amory Hordern, joining us now. Amory, what does the US want out of these talks? Does it just want China not to help Russia, or does it want China to actively talk Russia down, i.e. find a way out of this? Well, I think it would be the latter guy, but I think they're willing to take what they can get in this moment. For the, for at the moment, China has tried to remain somewhat neutral. They haven't co come out and condemned what Russia, Russia is doing outright, but at the same time, they have also have called for peace and they've held calls with Ukraine as well. I think a lot of focus will be on if there's any potential of China giving military assistance from the reporting over the weekend, U.S. officials saying that that is an ask that Putin has made 
to Beijing. But so far, there's been no reporting or intel that China is actually following up on that. So I think this meeting comes at a critical time for the U.S. to be frank with Beijing on what they would expect. And for them, would be putting the pressure on Putin to make sure that he knows that he would be crossing that line with really what is his only closest ally right now if he were to, um, if he were to continue with this war. And Marie, talk to us a little bit about how you square United, the United States' own tensions with China. We're talking about tariff, tariffs, a, a trade war that's kind of ongoing in the background with their relationship uh, with Russia in particular. How did those two conflicts kind of work together or work against each other? Well, I think at this moment it might actually help the United States, not the fact that they've had this trade conflict over the past few years and that's likely going to continue. But when you look at trade, even though Russia and China, their trades have their trade between the two countries have reached new heights since 2015. When you talk, look at military arms going from Russia to China, even though China has some better technology, that dwarfs what China has in trade between the European Union and the United States. And this is really telling what Secretary Raimondo said last week, really putting chip makers on guard about usurping and going yeah. around U.S. sanctions to make sure that these Chinese companies know that they need to come in line with the sanctions regimes and they can't be seen helping President Putin. A uh, headline coming through on the story that we're covering, Russia may halt wheat, corn, rye, barley exports on March the 15th. Uh, this according to Interfax. Uh, we'll try and get some details on what exactly is happening here, but that would have serious implications and ramifications, certainly in North Africa, in Egypt, in places like mm -hmm. that, Amory. Uh, so the, uh, the, the cost of this is going to spread out and continue to be uh, a global phenomenon. Which brings me to my kind of last question here. The, the Chinese, as you say, are heavily interlinked into the global economy. If they provide a route for Russia to find its way back into the global economy, there's a risk of secondary sanctions here. How clear is the U.S. going to be to China that it doesn't want to go down that road? Well, I think Jake Sullivan over the weekend, the president's national security advisor, signaled that there have been these very direct conversations in private. And now just the fact that he is going to Rome, meeting with the top Chinese diplomat, I think proves that these conversations are going to be pretty direct face to face. I imagine that is what they are going to say uh, to his Chinese counterpart. Well, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern, our Washington correspondent, we thank you so much for your time. Coming up, China orders a lockdown to one of the country's big tech centers. Companies like Apple will feel the pinch. We'll look at what this means for the country's growth prospects next. This is Bloomberg. We're an hour into the U.S. trading session. A little bit of green on the screen. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking the moves. Abby, what are you watching? Well, Creedy, we do have some green on the screen for stocks. We, at this point, have stocks higher. In the pre-market, sharply higher. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq up more than 1%, then a little bit of a dip right now. That S&P 500 up six-tenths of 1%. This as oil falls. WTI crude is down about 7% and at uh, close to $100 a barrel. Not there yet, but we could see that move lower, as we've been talking about over the last week. That typically, when you see a huge surge up, it often is unsustainable and will reverse to some degree. As for what else is moving in the market and what has been going on over the last six days really under the radar, this massive backup in yield. We have been talking about it here, uh, but relative to oil, commodities, stocks, and everything else going on, this 37 basis point six-day backup in the 10-year yield is really just incredible. This, of course, into the Fed uh, meeting the decision on Wednesday at 2.1%. Uh, the highest since I'm actually not sure what level, but probably 2019, I'm guessing. Uh, so you have this huge backup that suggests that the Fed is likely to do that one hike, maybe more based on this huge move. But also another big story, the China tech plunge. We've been following that over the last couple of days, now down three days in a row. The, Ch the Golden Dragon China index down off of its lows, but nonetheless, last week, the worst week ever uh, going back. Actually, the worst week since 2008. The last three days, the worst three days since ever. And you can see JD.com and Alibaba more pain. The question is, will this China tech pain bleed into the rest of the markets? Up top, we're looking at the Stock 600 tech index along with the NASDAQ 100. In yellow, we're looking at that Golden Dragon 
Dragon Index, and you can see it's an absolute plunge from its peak in February, all of that having to do a lot with Alibaba and the Beijing crackdown on tech, down 74%. If that's not a bear market, I don't know what is. But again, there's this huge divide guy between the NASDAQ 100 and along with the stock 600 tech index. Are we going to see a similar move? Hopefully not, but who knows? Yep, panda bear. Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Abigail, on what's happening in these markets uh, right now. Um, that story relating to what is happening in China, what is happening with COVID, uh, seems to be kind of re-emerging onto the agenda right now. It's interesting, actually, compare and contrast. JP Morgan, masking in corporate offices to be voluntary now for all. Uh, JP Morgan to end mandatory testing for unvaccinated staff. JP Morgan comments to staff in a memo uh, on office measures. This is now being circulated. Uh, JP Morgan to resume hiring unvaccinated individuals from April the 4th. Here in the UK, uh, the, the rules have largely gone. In the United States, they're fading fairly fast. But in China... The zero COVID policy is still in force and it's having a meaningful impact. China taking now some tough steps to deal with a doubling of coronavirus cases nationwide. It's now locking down the, the city of Shenzhen and forbidding people from leaving uh, a province in the northeast parts of the country, just north of North Korea. Sam Fazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us now. Sam, what is the long-term trajectory here? It is clear that the vaccines in China aren't as effective. It is clear that they haven't broken the back of the virus. It is clear that this zero COVID policy is going to have large economic impacts for quite some time. What do you see China doing next? Is there a way out from this? Um, hi, Guy. I honestly don't see an easy way out of this. So there's, let's say there's two things they can do. They can let it rip, which is obviously not what their, uh, their intention is at the minute. And then, of course, that has people sick, people off work, and enormous costs in terms of health, health and impact on people, deaths, etc. The vaccines do have some effectiveness, but they're just not as good as what we've seen with Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna shots and the adenoviral shots. So, so that's one way, which I don't think they're going to do. But the other one is just keep doing it this way, which, of course, will have a similar impact in that shut down cities, shut down ports, still don't function. And um, I just don't see how they can get out of this uh, without resorting to some massive wave of vaccinations again and then letting it rip a little bit like New Zealand. Sam, let's talk a little bit about your latter point here, the idea that perhaps there needs to be another wave of vaccinations to make this uh, zero COVID policy uh, just a little bit more functional. Do you see the likelihood of perhaps that fourth booster shot in, in China or even here in the United States? What does that look like? Yeah, I think we should leave the, the West out of this conversation because the fourth shot, I'm not convinced yet that there's really much need for it unless you're obviously having immunosuppressed situation or really elderly, etc. There's no data that suggests to me yet that, that we need to go there, um, especially that the effect is short-lived. Israel has already shown us that. In China, what I think they need to do is not just any fourth shot. I think the data that I've seen so far, Mexico had some good data, some of the other South American countries have some good data. If you combine a mRNA shot, for example, from Pfizer or whatever, yeah. on top of what China's already used, you get a really good effect. That's going to be interesting because they haven't approved any of those vaccines. Well, is Sam Fazelli. production oh, possible, Sam? Is, is, is that something uh, that we have the scale of production to be able to do? How quickly could China, I, I, if it was given the technology or be able to license it, be able to ramp it up to that kind of level? You yeah, know, but Guy, and I'll be very quick here. China already has a regulatory filing for the BioNTech shot in their hands since some, summer last year. They can approve it, probably 100 million doses. The US has surplus doses. They could agree in a deal, I don't know how feasible that is or whether they want to do that, to donate those shots or sell them to them. I think the government can do that. So you could get a few hundred million shots relatively, relatively easily. Well, Sam Fazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence, we thank you so much of your time. How big of an impact will this have on China's economy, though? Let's bring in Tom Orlick, chief economist for Bloomberg Economics. Tom, wonderful to have you. Let's talk a little bit about that impact. What is the read through of these kind of port shutdowns, of these city shutdowns into essentially China's bottom line? So I think there's um, there's three things going on here that we need to think about. So the first is the immediate negative impact of the fresh lockdowns that we've seen. Shenzhen 
is not a small part of China's economy. A major industrial center, tech center, port, huge population, shutting down Shenzhen is not zero cost. The second piece of it is the big question, what happens next? In 2020, the shutdown of Wuhan was a prefiguring of the shutdown of the entire Chinese economy. Is that going to happen this time? Don't have any good information on it, but you don't shut down Shenzhen for nothing. If we have broader shutdowns, clearly that's an additional drag on China's growth with ripples for the rest of the world. The third big question, which again is in the world of speculation, but what's the interaction here with Russia and Ukraine and US sanctions? One of the big yeah. stories over the weekend was the idea that Russia has been asking China for military help. China has denied that. We'll see how that story plays out. But potentially, in a nightmare worst case scenario, we could have a situation where COVID fears are back for China and China is somehow dragged into the US, Ukraine, Russia situation with implications for sanctions and for China's exports and their access to technology. What kind of sanctions would you expect? Would it be financial sanctions? Would it be the financial sector that was to be sanctioned? Do we have any model, Tom, for how this could be applied? What are the most effective tools to be used against China were sanctions to be necessary? So I think we're still in the world of breaking news and speculation on this one, Guy, so I'm kind of reluctant to go into too much detail. Um, but if you think about what's happened to China in the last few years with sanctions on technology, with tariffs on exports, with the beginnings of financial decoupling, delisting of Chinese firms in the United States, for example. I think there are clearly some areas where if these stories turn out to be true and China is dragged into the Russia, Ukraine, US situation, then there are some avenues where existing controls could be expanded and hardened. Tom, I'm curious about the read through into the United States. I think one of the main stories that has come about on the back of this essentially shutdown has been Foxconn and the impact on Apple's uh, kind of supply chain what is the read through into American companies, corporate America? Well, China is the second biggest economy in the world. So bad news for China is now bad news for the rest of the world. And you hit on one of the dynamics. China is a center for production um, and a driver of demand for some of the biggest US companies from Apple to Nike to McDonald's. Um, but the consequences go further than that. Um, the world continues to struggle with supply chain snarl-ups. Well, guess what? Shenzhen, one of the world's busiest ports, one of the world's busiest tech and industrial centers, has just locked down. Clearly, that is not good news for supply chains, and that has implications for the inflation outlook as well. Tom, always smart analysis. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed. Tom Orlick of Bloomberg Economics on what is happening in China and potentially the implications for China were it to be dragged in to the Ukrainian conflict. Coming up, the war has already had an impact on supply chains. We've already started to see that coming through. We've now got this Chinese factor to think about in terms of Shenzhen. Uh, we're going to talk all about this next with the CEO of Freight Raves, Craig Fuller. Great analysis. You want to listen to this. It's up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rich Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Pat Toomey, the senator of Pennsylvania. That's happening on Bounds of Power at 12 p.m. here in New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's a first word. I'm Rishka Gupta. The British government is set to offer a new system for admitting refugees fleeing the war in Ukraine after several weeks of criticism. The new system includes payments to households accepting refugees. Cabinet member Michael Gove told the BBC he expects tens of thousands of Ukrainians will eventually be admitted. North Korea may test an ICBM as soon as this week. That's according to South Korea's Yonhap News Agency. A report says South Korea and the U.S. have detected signs of an imminent test of an intercontinental ballistic missile. North Korea hasn't test launched an ICBM since 2017. 
And in sports, pro football star Tom Brady changed his mind and is not retiring after all. Brady said he will return for a 23rd season in the National Football League. The Tampa Bay quarterback says he's realized his place is still on the field and not in the stands. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Guy. Thank you very much indeed, Riddika. The number of container ships waiting off one of China's biggest ports is rising as the country doubles down on its COVID-0 policy. The latest lockdown in Shenzhen adds more delays to the strained global supply chain. Shenzhen is the fourth largest port in the world. Just to give you a, good, a little bit of context here, this is a massive blow uh, to the freight market. Joining us now to discuss this is the founder and CEO of FreightWaves, which analyzes the data for this industry, Craig Fuller. Craig, um, Shenzhen shutting down. This is a massive port, fourth largest in the world. How are you reading the implications? Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty. This is something that we thought we were uh, largely done with or, or that was behind us is the COVID impact. But China's zero tolerance policy has reminded us that supply chains are still subject to massive disruptions. And uh, the COVID element in supply chains is still ever present. Um, if we remember back in the United States when Omicron hit, uh, we, we really just sort of treated it as an unresolvable and sort of gave up on trying to contain it and just went about our lives. Uh, China doesn't seem to operate that way or want to operate that way. And because of it, I think we'll, we'll see a large uh, disruption to global supply chains. This is expected to spread or would expect it to spread if we've seen it, the precedent that was set in the West. And if it does and China decides to continue their zero tolerance policy, it could have massive implications, very similar to what we saw in early 2020. Craig, can you talk to us through the timeline here? If you do start to see the shutdown now in the ports, when does it kind of come back? When do you see the read through into the rest of the world? And where does that translate into things like shipping rates or trucking rates? Yeah, it takes about six to eight weeks for uh, when you see a shutdown for it to impact the Western economies just because it takes a while for that freight to ship. The good news for uh, the American freight market, at least short term, is that there is a lot of uh, still uh, bottlenecks and uh, port uh, at the ports. There's a lot of containers that are uh, still available. So we, we have some short term uh, kept, uh, demand that will keep the freight market moving. But if this goes on for months, or continues to be disruptive, and we have fits and starts, it could have profound impact. As you mentioned, uh, freight rates, particularly those out of China, uh, it actually depressed those rates. If we stop, if we start seeing ships not hauling cargo, but actually sitting at ports, uh, we'll see freight rates drop uh, because there won't be any demand. Uh, and so we'll see uh, the alternative uh, short term really drop, but long term, We'll also see a surge because a lot of those products will, will have, there'll be a substantial backlog. So I think it all depends on how long and how uh, uh, pervasive this is throughout the economy uh, really will tell us whether this is a repeat of 2020 or short term blip. Craig, um, as we speak, WTI crude, the US benchmark falling below 100 bucks a barrel. Uh, that's a $35 swing this month. How is that kind of volatility impacting the freight industry? Diesel certainly a major factor here in Europe right now. What are you seeing? How much of this is kind of easy to pass on? Do the models cope with this kind of volatility? What impact is fuel having? Well, the good news for the larger trucking companies, which have not had a lot of relief lately, uh, just because of the driver shortage uh, and the lack of being able to fill drivers, is that they'll be able to pass these costs on to shippers, people that buy capacity. So 75 to 80% of the capacity in the United States is fixed under contracts and those contracts into fuel surcharges. So a lot of those cost increases uh, will be passed on to uh, shippers and then ultimately consumers. Uh, as it relates to the spot market, that's where the squeeze is. When you see this really high rapid increase in fuel prices is it squeezes out the owner operators which operate in the spot market uh, and uh, they did see a tremendous impact uh, uh, last week and over the last two weeks. And so uh, short-term relief will be positive uh, for the trucking industry, but we are seeing signs of a slowdown in freight demand. Uh, it's really in many ways caught us off guard because you normally expect the shipping season to pick up in March. March is one of the best months in freight, uh, particularly the domestic surface market. And that has not shown up this year. And so uh, it's hard to understand what is causing that. 
but we are seeing a slowdown in freight and therefore spot rates uh, for those owner operators, they're not able to pass on those fuel surcharges to, to shippers because uh, they're simply just chasing the rate down. Craig, a lot of what's driven some of that commodity volatility you were just talking about has been, of course, those geopolitical tensions with Russia, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Can you speak to a little bit about what that means for the shipping market in particular, specifically around the Black Sea area? Well, I, I think any when you have disruptions and you see a lot of the agricultural commodities and other commodities, energy related, uh, and, and just any of the mining commodities that come out of uh, Ukraine and Russia, that is has a, a tremendous impact on the global economy. Uh, but I think a lot of that is really European related. We do see high uh, increases in rates uh, for these products and commodity prices really accelerate, which impacts everybody. The good news for North America is that we're a net exporter of the items that are seeing these rapid increases, whether it's agriculture or uh, a lot of energy commodities. Yeah. Uh, we are a large producer of those. So we, in some ways that benefits particularly the freight market because uh, a lot of the industrial activity in the United States is tied to the, those commodities. So whether we're talking food or whether we're talking uh, energy or energy related, a lot of our industrial economy is actually uh, benefits when you see high demand. So in some ways, but Craig, uh, at least Craig, long is that, term, is that it could have a net uh, increase in demand and in manufacturing in the United States, and that is a positive development. But certainly uh, it, that will have a tremendous impact on prices. It could create uh, uh, an acceleration of inflation. All of that is, has a negative uh, impact on uh, global markets. Craig, if, if we don't see wheat, corn, rye, et cetera, being shipped out of Russia or Ukraine. It has to come, I'm assuming, to the markets that it currently serves from further away. Is there the seaborne capacity to do that? Is there the capability to pivot uh, and bring in crops from elsewhere? Does the global sort of food supply chain, how much flexibility does it have built in, into it right now? Well, the good news is, particularly if we're looking at Europe being the most impacted, is those uh, the, there is a, uh, an imbalance. There's more freight coming into the United States from Europe than there is going the other way. So that trade lane is actually has a lot of available capacity. And so the ships that are uh, able to uh, transport grains from the United States into Europe actually have available capacity. And therefore, I don't think we, it will be a capacity issue as it relates to freight out of the United States into Europe. Uh, so generally, that's a positive, and it's true as well as, uh, for Canada. And so North American being a supplier of these grains uh, will actually be able to supply Europe with a dependable amount of supply and shipping will not be a factor in disrupting that. Um, all of this, of course, uh, depends on how long this goes on and whether we see continuous outbreaks or an acceleration in geopolitical tension uh, that impacts all of it. But generally, I think the U.S., and the uh, Canadian agricultural markets and really throughout the Americas can handle it. And because they tend to be, uh, uh, particularly out of the US, tends to receive more freight from Europe than it sends out, it actually could in some ways balance those lanes. Well, Craig Fuller, it is fascinating to talk about this. Freight Waves founder and CEO. Guy, I'm very curious about how this all plays out because it, it, it's, it's crazy to think that there are going to yep. be these kind of uh, decline when you talk about commodities, yet you heard what Craig said. There's simply the shipping market isn't quite digesting it in the way we would think they would. So I, I think the story around food is going to be the one that we're going to spend actually most of this year talking about, uh, particularly here in Europe. Uh, I think if you are going to see a failed crop effectively in Ukraine and then you're going to see Russia not shipping grains around the world, particularly into kind of key North African markets and areas like that, that is going to be a hugely inflationary and potentially societal uh, impact. So uh, I think the we don't fully yet understand the implications of it. I hear what Craig's saying about the fact that there is capacity to ship out of Canada, et cetera, and the North American uh, and North America more broadly. But nevertheless, this is going to be inflationary. And we saw what happened last time. We saw ag prices going up as much as this. We got the Arab Spring. The impact geopolitically, I don't think we fully felt it yet. Anyway, it's going to be something that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. This is Bloomberg.